everyone, I'm Rochelle Chernowski. This is Shell Point Today for Monday, May 27th. On today's show, we take a trip through the Suez Canal, which revolutionized travel through Europe and Asia. We'll also talk to Fred Rosenstroke, whose memories of life on the front in World War II are made even more extraordinary by his pre-war experiences in Germany. But first, we want to remind you that today is Memorial Day, so all Shell Point offices are closed, including the medical center and the pharmacy. They will reopen for normal business tomorrow. We do, however, have a special lunch today at the Crystal Room to mark Memorial Day. Now, take a note, it is a lunch. The Shell Point Life magazine mistakenly reported it as a dinner. But the Crystal Room special Memorial Day buffet will be open from 11 a.m. until 2 p.m and feature the piano stylings of Stan Mlezko. Once again, join us for a special Memorial Day buffet at the Crystal Room from 11 a.m. until 2 p.m. The Crystal will be closed for dinner this evening. Many of us think of Memorial Day as the unofficial start of summer, since school is letting out and the weather has begun to really heat up. But summer also means something else here in Florida, hurricane season. Are you prepared? Do you know what should go in your hurricane kit and when you should have it ready? Answers to all these questions are coming this Friday as we hold our annual hurricane seminar. We'll hear from our Shell Point staff members who do the actual planning, as well as meteorologists who offer insight on what to expect this hurricane season. Bring your questions to the 2013 Hurricane Seminar, happening this Friday at 10.30 a.m. in the Church Auditorium, and also being rebroadcast all next week on Shell Point TV, Channel 13. When the Academy resumes tomorrow, you have the chance to learn something about the wonders about Egypt. Not ancient wonders like the pyramids, but modern-day wonders like the Suez Canal. Built in 1869, this canal allows ship travel between Europe and Asia. Find out more about this and other treasures in Mount Sinai at an academy class with history professor Adrian Kerr, happening tomorrow at 10 a.m. in the Grand Cypress Room. Here is a preview. Hello, everyone. I'm here today with Professor Adrian Kerr. We're talking about our next stop and the historical tour of the Middle East this summer, Suez Canal, St. Catherine's Monastery, and Mount Sinai. Thanks for joining me, Adrian. Thank you for inviting me, Terry. This sounds like it's very special to us, St. Catherine's Monastery. Let's start with that. St. Catherine's Monastery is the oldest surviving, continually inhabited monastery in the world mm -hmm. of any religion. Um, it was founded by the Byzantine Empire uh, on the site that was believed to be the site of the burning bush where Moses talked to God. So from that point of view, it was a very important uh, religious location and a small monastery was built there around about 450 AD. Um, and then a, an interesting event took place where St. Catherine, who was an early Christian martyr, who had been um, persecuted during Diocletian's persecution of Christians, if you remember, they were not allowed to meet. Um, she was converting the pagan people in Rome to Christianity, and she was caught, and she was threatened with torture, and uh, she died on a spinning wheel, and which hence the words Catherine wheel in a firework. Um, her body Body was miraculously found intact 400 years later on the hills outside the monastery. So they brought her body into the monastery and it's in silver caskets, um, of course not allowed to see these silver caskets, mm -hmm. and they built a wall around this monastery. So for two reasons, the burning bush site, uh, St. Catherine was found there, but most important probably of all is the Ten Commandments were given to Moses on the hills beside the uh, monastery. Must be amazing to stand there. It is absolutely amazing. Uh, it's spooky, um, and it's very hard to get to. Um, it's in South, It's in um, Egypt, um, but it's about uh, 180 miles from civilization. So you take your life in your hands, driving through um, mountainous roads, and then suddenly you open up into this valley, and there's a monastery in front of you. Amazing. And we've all heard of the Suez Canal. It's going to be interesting to hear the way you present it all historically to us, and, and having been there yourself... Yes, I was there just a few weeks ago, and of course people think the Suez Canal was built in 1869, but in fact it was started about 1500 BC. 
The Egyptians wanted to link the Nile mm -hmm. with the uh, Red Sea because the trade of ivory um, and scents we've talked about and also uh, precious woods, ebony, would come up from the east coast of Africa and into Egypt itself and they made a shortcut from the Nile to the Red Sea, or they tried to, but it's a big undertaking and it failed a few times and they never quite got a, um, a deep enough, wide enough channel that could make it uh, significant. It kept on filling up with sand. Then the Romans tried it and the Romans built a uh, link from the canal to um, Cairo and there's an evidence of the um, Roman brickwork which you can see in Cairo where they made the canal extension. So there was in ancient times a link between the Nile and the Red Sea. Um, the Persians had also helped empty, uh, clean out the canal and got it working again. Um, then it fell into disuse as Egypt went into decline um, and then the French influence in um, Egypt after Napoleon um, meant that the French um, ambassador to Cairo, um, de Lesseps, persuaded the leader of the country to consider a project linking um, the Mediterranean to the Red Sea, which was going to take half the time to get to India than going around the Cape. And he managed to get funding for it, as we know. It was a public company with shares bought by European powers, and also the Egyptians had a big chunk of shares. And after 10 years of terrible misfortune to the hundreds of people who died in making the canal, they linked the two together. And Empress Eugenie of France <coughs> led the parade of ships grandly through the Suez Canal for the first time in 1869. Uh, it it's, everything is always more than it seems on the surface when we have an historian to tell us about it. Thank you so much. You will be able to hear more about this fascinating topic with Professor Adrian Kerr tomorrow, 10 a.m. All are welcome. You can sign up right at class. On this Memorial Day, we thought it appropriate to rerun the story of Fred and Lori Rosenstrauch. And for those who haven't heard it before, here is the short version. They both grew up Jewish in Germany and both escaped the Nazis by extraordinary means. After moving to the United States, Fred enlisted in the U.S. Army and went back to fight on the front lines in Europe. After a serious injury, his career path changed to working as a translator and interrogator. We asked Fred and Lori to share some of their wartime memories. Well, I was 14 years old when we left Germany town of Bopfingen, B-O-P-F-I-N-G-E-N, -E and we left, I left there in December 1939, came to the United States, I believe it was Christmas Eve. Well, we were Jewish, and of course you know what happened to the Jewish people over there, you were lucky to get out, and we and my dad were fortunate enough to get out at that time. The only experience I had with the U.S. was that my dad's sister, who lived in the Bronx, and she's been in the United States for many, many years, and had another sister in Chicago that lived in the United States for many, many years. His father and my father worked for the same company, and uh, for some reason or other, my parents thought he was a little boy, so they were invited uh, to the Rosenstrauch's house, and um, uh, the little boy turned out to be about my age, <laughs> and so that's, that's how we met. I couldn't enlist because I wasn't a citizen, so I had a number, forgot the number of course, and I went down to the draft board and asked them to push my number down so I could get in. So after that, uh, I don't know how much longer it was, but I was called up and I went in the U.S. Army. I was uh, in the infantry and I took my basic training in Camp Roberts, California. That's close to St. Louis Obispo and we had 23 weeks of telephone wire and knife fighting. And about two weeks before we left, we fell out one morning, they said, take off your fatigues and going, we're gonna give you fatigues. Well, we knew we weren't going to the Pacific then. And then we went, uh, changed the clothes to ODs and 
They shipped us the Fort Meade. Then uh, Fort Meade, we were shipped over the convoy, of course, and uh, I wound up in England, where I was attached to the 2nd Infantry Division, the Engine Head Division. And then we went to St. Lo, which was on the 4th of July, by the way, when we got to St. Lo. And every gun and artillery went off that day. And, and then we went uh, to Brest, France, B-R-E-S-T. And we were supposed to take that in a week, and we were there for over three weeks. And when we finally got there, it was hand-to-hand -hand fighting. And uh, we finally took Brest. That night we slept in a bed, first time ever. And uh, not realizing that other people slept in their beds before. And we whole regiment was full of fleas. So we went outside on the field. They burned all our uniforms and sprayed us with DDT and gave us new uniforms. I never wrote so many letters in my entire life. Half of them which he didn't get. But, oh yeah, we stayed in touch. But of course there were no phones, no... You wrote the letters and you hoped they got there and they were all approved and reread. And the one letter that shouldn't have got, I wrote, shouldn't have got back here, I wrote a love letter to her and it came to my mom. <laughs> yeah, and his she, mother <laughs> called me and said, I think I got a letter that's meant for you. You better come and get it. <laughs> There's a couple of incidents though when we went out on patrol and uh, I was the patrol sergeant and, and this, when, we, when you came back in you had to give a password. And my accent was pretty bad at the time. So when we, I used to give the password, and the Americans started shooting at us. So the guy said, "You keep your mouth shut from now on." <laughs> we give the password, yeah. And uh, after Bastogne, I wound up in a hospital, and uh, that was the end of my fighting. Well, I had 37 days on the line one time, and 42 on the. On, on, on another time, and usually the infantry guy usually lasted about a day at the most. So uh, the good Lord was with me all the way. Then we fell out, and uh, I was on, couldn't hardly walk yet. I was still on crutches. And uh, I thought, well, one more, they called my name out. And I figured, well, one more detail to take the troops to the bus or somewhere. And uh, they said, you to, to report to the headquarters. And there was that big general standing there. And I went in and I saluted and he said, uh, you are going to officer's training school. I said, sir, you're making a mistake. He said, no, you are, you're going to officer's training school. <laughs> so they sent me to a place called La Vessene, France. After that, they sent us to a town in France. I don't remember the name of the town in France where they had German prisoners. And we had to go interrogate them, learn how to interrogate with the lower ranks. After that, they sent us to Frankfurt, Germany. And there we had higher ranking officers. And then the Nuremberg. I cannot give you any details what we interrogated, who, or anything like that. you find out in years to come, but not now. In those days, the, um, any meat products, meat or sausage or anything, was rationed. And you got points. You got so many points a month, I think. And um, uh, if I wanted to send him sausage, I had to give points, and my mother wasn't too happy about that. She said that he didn't need the sausage over there. <laughs> so I said, okay, I'm not going to eat my share of meat that week, and I'll send him a sausage. 
the, the hard salami type of sausage. And he did get them, miraculously. And um, you used to put them on your belt, didn't yeah. you? put them on my right belt. He'd warm on the belt and... Um, we, we split them up between the squat. And I understand, I wasn't there, but from what he tells me, it it caught um, shrapnel. Piece of shrapnel. Piece right of in shrapnel there. in the sausage instead of in him. <laughs> <laughs> so it was worth the points. <laughs> Continuing our theme this Memorial Day, David Howenstein brings us a variety of military-related stories in this week's episode of Listening to the Words. On this week's Listening to the Words program, gratitude looms large. Remembering when we put flowers on all our family's graves for Decoration Day. After all these years, a Vietnam veteran is reminded anonymously of the importance of his service. A Marine fulfills his promise by finding and making a new home for the dog with whom he bonded in the war-torn Middle East. A World War II veteran finally receives all his medals because an eight-year-old girl insisted on it. Five-year-olds inspire a writer who thought he'd heard it all. A children's story in which the dragon suffers with a head cold it was written by a nurse down the road at Health Park. This is David Howenstein, promising you all that and the ever-lurking more any hour of any day this week by simply tuning to Shell Point TV Channel 13. And this programming note. This program will not be aired for the next two weeks to allow for special programming. Listening to the words will return the week of June 17th. Welcome to the Happening segment of Shell Point TV. I'm Suzanne Zavada and I'm here with Mary Franklin on Monday, May 27th. And it is Memorial Day, so remember that the administrative offices will be closed today. We'll start the day out at 9 o'clock with round robin men's doubles tennis playing out at the tennis courts at the Woodlands. At 9.15, billiards will be played in the Resident Activity Center. And also at 9.15, we have pottery with instruction available in the pottery studio on the island and virtual bowling taking place in the resident activity center on the island. At 10.30, the Disciple Men's Bible Study Group will be meeting in the game room at the Woodlands. And at 10.45, we have the table tennis playing clinic in the tarpon room on the island. And from 11 to 2, you can celebrate Memorial Day with a lunch at the Crystal. Well, that's it for the morning. Here's Mary with the afternoon. Thank you, Suzanne. At 12 o'clock, Mahjong players will want to be gathering in the Sable Room at the Woodlands. And at 1.15, you can play Scrabble in the Library Lounge or join the Table Tennis Group in the Tarpon Room. 2 o'clock, the fun gals of the BDI Bead Club will be gathering in the Oak Room. And at 6.30, we have Duplicate Bridge being played in the Game Room at the Woodlands, and we wrap up Memorial Day with 7 o'clock Square Dancing in the Health Club. Suzanne and I hope you have a wonderful day and we look forward to seeing you right back here tomorrow. Hi, I'm Terry Koleth and I'd like to tell you what's coming in the Academy tomorrow. A computer college class review and practice basic computer skills with Jim Plummer of Parkwood. Sign up as required. And Professor Adrian Kerr presents the Suez Canal, St. Catherine's Monastery, and Mount Sinai. Sign up required. We have an Apple iPad Tips and Techniques class for those who have signed up with Penny Modridge of Nautilus and Bruce Findlay of Sundial. Menus for Memorial Day. In the Crystal Room, the Crystal Platter is the Memorial Day Buffet. The soup of the day is tomato. In the Island Cafe for lunch, enjoy a turkey club with chips for $6.95. For dinner, enjoy charred pork with cherry orange sauce, mash, and broccoli for $7.95. And the Palm Grill is closed on Mondays. All menus are available 24 hours a day at www.shellpoint.net. Welcome to the Village Church Connections on this very special Memorial Day. I'm Andy Hawkins, the senior pastor of the Village Church. Memorial Day is a very special holiday for all of us Americans. 
Uh, certainly memorials are very important for us and especially here at Shell Point where we participate in many memorials in which we celebrate the lives of our friends and family members and loved ones. And while many people really don't want a special service to observe their passing, it is important that we remember and that we treasure the memories of those who have touched our lives. And one of the most frequent biblical injunctions is simply to remember. That is to remember the people who have gone before us and the legacy that they have left us, the lives that they have led, and how their history has produced our present. On this Memorial Day, we remember a very specific group of people, all those who have died while in military service as they defended the freedoms that we enjoy. This is not an abstract exercise for many of the residents here at Shell Point. I count it a privilege to minister in the context of, of the generation that Tom Brokaw called the greatest generation, the generation marked by a people who resiliently got through the Great Depression and then fought a war which would prove critical in preserving the freedoms that so many of us enjoy in so much of the world. Indeed, there are veterans here at Shell Point who have participated in World War II and in the Korean War and even in Vietnam. They have all seen the sacrifices made by their fellow soldiers, sailors, and flyers. Many of those memories are hard memories, bitter memories. Perhaps it would be easier for most of us to forget them. But this is not an occasion for forgetting. This is an occasion for remembering, remembering the lives given for our nation's safety and security. And it has been this way since the beginning. Of the 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence, nine did not see the end of the Revolutionary War, making the ultimate sacrifice to establish a free people and nation. Uh, those signers were quite conscious of the sacrifices that piece of paper would require. As many of them would understand, they were signing their death warrant, knowing that King George would seek to suppress these upstart patriots. And so the declaration was concluded with these words, and I quote, and for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. So Memorial Day is an important day for all of us Americans, but it is especially important for us Christians. One of the chief freedoms protected by our military has been the freedom of religion, a freedom protected by the First Amendment of the Constitution. It is a freedom that is easy to take for granted in this country, but when a global view is taken, we see that we are the exception rather than the rule, that most of the globe is marked by restrictions and persecutions on people of faith. Indeed, hundreds of thousands of Christians are martyred every year somewhere simply for practicing their religion and exercising their consciences. That means that the sacrifices of our military over these two and a half centuries are especially precious to the people of faith. Again, that's the way it was from the very beginning of our nation. And that's why the founders explicitly entrusted themselves, as the text said a few moments ago as I read it, the protection of divine providence. And as they signed their death warrant, they recognized that they were doing so in the presence of God. They were fulfilling that commitment to Him as they were signing the Declaration of Independence. So please know that we at the Village Church are mindful of the services of our military and we treasure their memories and value their sacrifices. Sacrifices that have provided us with opportunities for worshiping and serving the living God. We trust that you will join with us in remembering those on this special occasion. God bless you all on this Memorial Day. We're glad you joined us for today's show. Tune in tomorrow as we preview our movie night selection, the 1949 version of the famous novel, Little Women. We'll also meet two neuropsychiatrists who are sharing the latest developments in mental health in an upcoming academy class. Until then, this is Shell Point Today for Monday, May 27th. I'm Rochelle Chernowski. From all of us here at Shell Point TV, we hope you have a great day and we'll see you again tomorrow.